Hi, Michelle. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. How are you doing? I'm good. You're already recording. Why are you recording? I wonder if it just um, slideshow from going, but I know folks are joining us. Um, I apologize for the issue with the link today. So hopefully um, we'll continue to have uh, folks joining us as we continue today's conversation. So to just introduce myself, my name is Ash Ahrens. I'm the Director of Community Engagement with the Graduate School of Social Work. Um, we're not quite to the number of folks registered, but thank you to all of you who are here this morning. Um, we're excited to get started and welcome you all to this incredible panel on transnational anti-racist praxis. We're joined by three incredible panelists and two esteemed moderators, the first of whom I have the privilege of introducing. So Dr. Michelle Hanna is a professor and the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Graduate School of Social Work at the University of Denver. Dr. Hanna has been with GSSW since 2005, teaching across the curriculum and including, including the Foundational Power, Privilege, and Oppression course, Child Welfare, Disproportionality, and Disparities Across Systems, Critical Race Theory, and Cultural and Linguistic Competency in Integrated Behavioral Health. Currently, she oversees two HRSA-funded workforce grants providing stipends to students who are interested in social work, uh, practice in integrated behavioral health, or substance use prevention, treatment, or recovery. I'll pass it over to Dr. Hanna. Thank you, Ash. Um, welcome, everyone. We're very excited uh, about our program that we have for you today. I bring you greetings from our Dean, Dr. Amanda Moore McBride, who is unable to be with us here uh, today at this time. Uh, as a champion of anti-racism, social justice, diversity, and inclusion, uh, Dean McBride wholeheartedly encourages our GSSW community to engage in conversations such as these as we lean into our charge as social workers to transform and change the world to be a more equitable place for all. Um, I want to thank uh, our second monitor, moderator, uh, Dr. Sofia Sarantakos, um, for envisioning today's event, and I would like to introduce her now. Um, Dr. Saren Tacos is an assistant professor here at the University of Denver uh, Graduate School of Social Work. Their work is focused on how professionalized social change workers and the organizations and institutions in which they are situated can seize white social work, the lineage of the profession that's been legitimized by people in power, taught and practiced most widely, and caused the most harm, and shape it into a tool of service in a tool in service of an abolitionist horizon. A central application of these abolitionist principles is Dr. Sauron uh, transformation of social work education into, as Bell Hooks calls it, the practice of freedom. One of the many ways they engage in this practice is through their course, creating new anchors and introduction to prison industrial complex abolition, which they develop for and teach to our MSW students. As part of their organizing work, Dr. Sarin Pacos co-created the Abolitionist Social Change Collective, or ASCC, which is a virtual space uh, for people engaged in all forms of unpaid social welfare and social work, or social change work, to build community of people who engage ideas and develop abolition-focused collaboration, advance non-carceral approaches to harm, accountability, and well-being, and work towards a more solidary focus form of social change work. So I will pass it off to Sophia. Oh, got to unmute first. It's 10 a.m. y'all, sorry. Uh, <laughs> good morning, everyone. Thank you, Michelle, um, so much for that intro. And hello to everyone joining us. Um, I'm so excited about the panelists here with us this morning and the discussion that we'll be engaging in. I just wanna say a few words uh, about why I convened this panel and why I think it's so important. Um, as humans and workers committed to social change and building a world where everyone thrives, we are currently facing huge and complex convening crises, racist state violence, ecological collapse, the fourth year of a, legal, of a lethal pandemic, just to name a few. And it's always been crucial to consider how the systemic struggles before us, particularly faced by people of the global majority are universal and demand solidarity across borders. 
Yet U.S. social, U.S.-based social work has consistently failed to make these considerations in material ways. This panel is a contribution toward a new future for U.S. social work, one where we move away from our isolationist ways and commit to building a stronger, unified, anti-racist workforce uh, dedicated to liberation. I see this conversation as the first of many here at GSSW focused on international organizing within our field. And I just wanna thank y'all so much for being here with us, sharing this space. And now I'll pass it back to Dr. Hanna so she can introduce our incredible panelists this morning. Thank you, Sophia. Um, first, I wanna introduce um, Chantel Thomas. Chantelle Thomas is the UK anti-racism lead at the British Association of Social Workers, the BASW, and course lead for the MA in Social Work Program at the Tavistock and Portman NHS Foundation Trust. She's a qualified social worker with over 15 years experience and prior to academia work in direct child safeguarding practice with a particular interest in work with vulnerable children and those from Black and global majority communities. In her BS, BASW role, those from Black, excuse me, Chantel works strategically to support the delivery of the Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion Plan. In particular, how anti-racist practice can be developed and implemented across and within the UK social work sector. Chantel has co-written a chapter entitled Risk and Safety, a strength-based perspective in work, working with Black families when there are safeguarding concerns in social work in a diverse society, transformative practice with Black ethnic minority individuals, I'm so sorry, and communities and contributed her practice knowledge to a book entitled Safeguarding Black Children by Dr. Claudia Bernard. She also co-developed and delivers a short course becoming an anti-racist practitioner leader, which holds relationship-based anti-racist practice at its heart and is based on a collective curious conversations and action. In Michelle, you are going in and out. I'm wondering if maybe you're hitting your space bar or some sort of button that's muting and unmuting it. You know, I think that I am. Thank you very much for telling me that. Uh, I will move off my space bar. Um, let me see. I don't know where I stopped, but I'll just go on. Chantal also co-developed and delivers a short course, Becoming an Anti-Racist Practitioner Leader, which holds relationship-based anti-racist practice at its heart and is based on a model for achieving emotionally intelligent, critically reflective, curious conversations and action in a safe space. Chantel is a senior academic and doctoral researcher whose thesis is asking, what can an autoethnographic study contribute to the understanding of issues of race and leadership in white-led organizations? She uses her passion, her position, personal and professional living experience of racism and intersectional oppression to be the voice of the unheard and to represent the needs of global majority communities using a strength-based and compassionate lens. That's Chantel William, uh, Thomas. Sorry, I made this font bigger and between the font and the glasses, I'm still having trouble <laughs> seeing what I'm reading, but I'm gonna do better. All right, moving on to our next uh, speaker is Dr. Karen Bullock. Uh, Dr. Bullock is a licensed clinical social work worker and the Ahern Endowed Professor in the Boston College of School of Social Work. Her practice interests include health disparities and health equity, in serious illness care, aging and gerontology and hospice, palliative and end of life care decision-making. Her research focuses on cancer care, so social support for older adults, diversity, equity, and cultural factors influencing health care outcomes. She has served as principal investigator and our co-investigator for over $5 million in federal grant funding, focused on equity and inclusion for workforce development, aging, and health network sustainability. Dr. Bullock is a John A. Hartford faculty scholar and serves on a national, on several national boards and committees, including the Social Work Hospice and Palliative Care Network, as vice chair and the immediate past chair of the American Cancer Society Oncology Social Work Research Peer Review Committee. She is a member of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine Roundtable, 
many on quality care for people with serious illness. Dr. Bullock won the 2012 Best Article Award from the Rutledge Journal of Social Work in End of Life and Palliative Care, as she has been featured in the Washington Post, USA Today, and Los Angeles Time as an expert in these areas. And last but not least, we have with us President Melissa Smith Haley, who is an LMSW, who is the 14th president of the National Association of Black Social Workers. She has served as president of the Clark Atlanta University and Metro District of Columbia chapters. She was the national vice president, national member at large, national conference co-chairperson for four years and national plenary, plenary co-chairperson. Um, president Smith Haley is the vice president of program operations for a nonprofit agency in Southeast Louisiana. She has successfully managed several state and federal contracts, totaling over millions, totaling millions of dollars annually and a staff of over 100. President Smith Haley received her bachelor's degree in mass communication from Xavier University in Louisiana and master's degree in social work from Clark Atlanta University in Georgia. She's an adjunct professor at the Millie Charles School of Social Work at Southern University in New Orleans since 2017. She teaches social work students diversity, administration, planning, and community organizing. She is passionate about the community in which she lives and serves. Her personal mottos are no one should be defined by their challenges and liberation is not a spectator sport. We welcome all of our presenters and we're gonna get right into our conversation. And Sophia, you wanna kick us off with the first question? Absolutely, I'd be honored to. Okay, so to kick us all off, um, I'd like to start with each of you sharing your thoughts on the history of anti-racist praxis within our profession and your particular geographies. So I'm gonna ask y'all to focus on the period um, from the late 1960s to before the 2020 rebellions for black liberation, uh, because there was a marked shift, um, at least in language in 2020. And I'd like to address that separately in a different question. Um, so how would you each categorize the history? And uh, you could talk about the tensions, progress, failures, and so on of anti-racist praxis between the late 60s and 2019 in the profession of social work. And then I'll start with you, President uh, Smith-Haley. And if in your response, you could actually discuss um, the long ignored impetus for NABSW's creation, I think our audience would actually really benefit from that context because unfortunately that's not taught enough in our schools of social work. Oh, definitely. Um, I, NABSW began in 1968. We are a 55 year old black organization who is dedicated to liberation of black people who experience oppression and marginalization in the United States. We have 70 chapters, over 70 chapters, 2000 members across the country. We have student chapters and we have regular adult uh, chapters or parent chapters as we call them. And basically in ABSW, and if you read our code of ethics, the code of ethics has the word black in it 20 times. And the word black is there 20 times because that is our target audience. We work with the black community. We're from the black community. We are not friendly visitors. We are vested members in the communities we live and serve. We are there to make a difference based on our lived experience as well as our learned experience. And so what happens through NABSW, we get together and we do we do workshops, we do webinars, we do a national conference, which really showcases the uh, talent of Black professionals across the country, and it's by Black people for Black people. And the reason being for that, because when you, um, it is very important as Black practitioners that we have safe space, right? So NABSW began, and uh, they went to a conference, uh, Black members went to a conference of uh, organization is now not in function right now, but it was the biggest social service organization at that time. And while they were there, they simply wanted to speak on issues as it pertains to Black people, and they were not allowed to. So after about two or three days of trying to command the stage, trying to get access to the stage, and they were denied, the Black social workers walked out of that conference and started the National Association of Black Social Workers. And it is not taught as it should be 
Washington schools of social work. I went to Clark Atlanta University, which is the oldest black social work school in the country. Black practitioners have existed as long as there has been a Jane Addams, there has been an Ida B. Wells. And you hear about Jane Addams and you hear about her contributions, but it wasn't until recently, right around the time of the women's suffrage movements, where we celebrated white women being able to vote because black women still couldn't vote, right? So in that celebration, you heard about Ida B. Wells and what and how much work she did for women's suffrage, but what you don't hear is that she still couldn't vote. So as schools of social work, it's really important to see black people, not just as clients, right? That we are leaders and liberators in the communities in which we serve. And as black practitioners, we should not have to ask and apologize and, and to code shift in order to be understood and heard in the communities that we live. So we are a strength-based organization. We talk about the greatness of black people. We talk about the greatness of black community. We're pan-Africanism talk about global issues, and we look at how we can help liberate our communities from the inside out. Thank you so much uh, for that kind of masterclass in um, how NABSW was created and, and the important history that I that you that is just lacking, as I said, in social work schools. If do you have um, something to, to say quickly about um, anti-racist praxis and how you've seen it evolve um, since perhaps the beginning of NABSW to about 2019? Well, what I, what I, you know, even the word anti-racist, uh, that's, that's new, right? That's mm -hmm. new. That's something you've heard in the last couple of years. Racism is entrenched in social work practice. It is entrenched in social work education. Uh, it's very little anti-ism there. You know, you can graduate from a school of social work and never have a professor of color. You can also graduate and you can get a license and not know anything about African-centered practice. So there are some real, uh, I guess, there are some misnomers about what anti-racist practice is and what it looks like. And it, even if it exists right now, having a black teacher is not anti-racism. If you're not learning about strengths and powers and how to work within a community and respect what you're there, you're not anti-racist. You have very, you know, it's almost, it's almost laughable how, how white practitioners, many have never even worked for anyone black or worked for somebody of color. So when you go into those environments, you know, we, you know, it's almost like you can hire every white person who comes through the door, but if they got a black supervisor, black manager, black vice president, that is something that is almost unheard of in the practice that we have. So I really believe wholeheartedly that there is a lot of work to be done in social work, not just in licensure, from the education and how we respect those who we serve and how we learn from those we serve. It's important that we have a diverse experience in leadership as well as in practice. Thank you so much for that, President uh, Smith-Haley. Dr. Bullock, I'll turn it over to you to add your thoughts. Sure, I wanna thank President Haley for her important statements and, and passion for the work um, that she and you and the organization are doing. And I'll sort of pick up there. Um, you mentioned Ida B. Wells and after Ida B. Wells, there was Mary Church Terrell and we can go down the list. And I agree um, that we're not teaching about the contributions of black people in social work in a very intentional way and, and echo the points that um, President Haley made about how many social workers are going into the field with limited to no knowledge. And so as it relates to anti-racist practices, um, although the Council on Social Work Education is now saying we want schools of social work to take up this issue of being anti-racist, working towards not being a racist, we don't have roadmaps and guidelines for doing that. Um, I recently said in a meeting to colleagues I understand that you can't teach what you don't know. How is it that we can expect as a profession that all of a sudden somewhere it falls out the sky that social work educators are going to be able to teach this curriculum? Where's the curriculum coming from? And what is that going to look like? And is that going to be a spectacle? Are we really helping anyone to just dangle the words out there as President Haley said, to talk about anti-racism, people are still confused about racism and the fact that racism exists. Some of my colleagues and students think that 
you know, racism didn't exist before the social unrest, the killing of uh, black and brown people by police while we were all standing still during the pandemic. I mean, I had colleagues and students to say, I thought we were living in a post-racial society. I mean, people are living their everyday lives, not seeing and experiencing racism while there are those of us who experience it on a regular basis. And so when we talk about the preparation of social workers, I think it's critically important, not only that we're beginning to have these conversations since the COVID-19 pandemic, because a lot of people weren't having them before the pandemic. And so the fact that we've begun to have these conversations and naming racism um, is to be commended, but where's the value and what do we do with it? There are so many educators who are preparing the next generation who themselves haven't been educated with these frameworks. And so I think, you know, we put up a poster saying this is who we are as social workers and this is what we commit to, but we really don't have the guidelines and roadmaps to what the shift should look like. And so I'm not sure that, um, you know, there's much action taking place as we're talking about, and I'm not saying that it isn't, I just don't see it reflected. And so another role that I have currently is to, uh, I am the chair of the National Committee on Race and Ethnic Diversity for NESW in Corinth. And to put it in a historical context in terms of the shifts, and as President Haley has already said, NABSW started in 1968, but the NESW as an organization has been trying to attend to the issues of equity and inclusion and racial and ethnic diversity. And the reason why I say trying is if we look at the history of what has emerged of various initiatives, the, initiative, the initiatives come forward, they look great, there are things in paper, NASW is really committed, but it's the practitioners on the front lines who are either going to buy into this. I mean, we can write as many statements as we want about being committed to anti-racism, but on the front lines, what is happening? And I know when I talk with colleagues, they're not sure um, if they're even racist. And so we've got a long way to go. We are making progress. But what I mean by that is racism hasn't been named for people. And so when we talk about an anti-racist practice, for those of us who experience racism, we know what it looks like. We can tell you what it feels like and all of those things. But there are many social workers, so to keep this to social work, who are not even sure that their actions are racist. I've said to some colleagues, like, that's really racist. And they said, well, nobody's ever said that to me before. Like, how is that racist? So it feels like we've just dropped a boulder down in the middle of things and said, here's this anti-racist praxis, have at it. And that doesn't work. And so, and, and if we don't do some remedial work with our colleagues who've never had this education, who don't know where to start, then it's just words. And we can look at that those types of actions happening. I mean, if we were to look back at the history of inquiry for NESW, some of the things that we're doing now, starting in 2022, 20, they were taking up as actions in 1969 you know, and very little progress. It wasn't the effort that didn't make the progress. What interferes with the progress are the individuals on the front line, social workers who aren't taking the action steps. So that's my perspective about the anti-racist praxis and how far we've come or how little we've done. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Bullock. I think before we turn it over to Ms. Thomas, I think one of the words you said, a big boulder, I think another big boulder in terms of language is reckoning, right? How many reckonings do we need to have, right? We keep using this language of 2020 was a reckoning. Uh, there's been so many and and not not the action to follow it. So I appreciate those insights so much. Um, Ms. Thomas, please, your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Just to acknowledge the contribution of my colleagues, um, my co-panelists you know, uh, panelists as well, because you could have seen me nodding, 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 nodding away there because I could identify, empathize with everything you were saying. Um, how far have we really come? Um, and when we look back, you know, anti-racism is a is a is a relatively new term, and some people are not comfortable with it. A lot of people don't know what to do with it. And part of my role again is to uh, work across the UK um, around implementing anti-racist practice onto the pre-qualifying curriculum, so students are taught um, about what that means and what that is, and how to 
um, go out there um, and 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 you know and practice in a way that is is less abusive, less oppressive, you know, less discriminatory. Um, so so going back, you know, in, historically. Um, I think it's, it's, it's meant, it was mentioned, you know, there was no term called anti-racism, you know, in, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s in the UK, you know, it was a time of turmoil for black people, particularly those of us coming from the Caribbean um, and, you know, called over, you know, during the wind, Windrush era to kind of help rebuild the UK. Um, we, we were met with, you know, uh, uh, um, um, uh, not not so uh, a pleasant in our responses, you know, we weren't welcomed, even though, you know, the UK uh, had come to, you know, particular islands in the Caribbean. It was a very political um, era as well to, uh, through those times, because there was so much happening um, in terms of um, just standing up for your rights. You know, we spoke about liberation um, we spoke about um, just the, 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 the context was quite uh, um, militant, you know, everything, anything black was seen as deviant, negative, other, um, and it was a very Eurocentric mindset um, and curriculum and practice, that, that's, that's how things were set, and, um, you know, as, a, as black academics, as black um, and practitioners, it was really important that we kind of cemented what it is um, we, we wanted out of, out of, you know, the country, the profession. As I said, you, you can't talk about social work practice without talking about the context and the climate um, during that time. And yeah, it was, it was definitely a time where people were a lot more active, a lot more outgoing, a lot more um, um, outspoken about what they wanted. And I think militant is a, is a term that I often use to explain that kind of era um, as well, because it was like a no-nonsense time. There was a lot of activism, as I mentioned. Um, and it does feel like maybe we have gone back a bit. Um, even though a lot happened, we probably moved on somewhat, um, but there was still a lot more um, that needed to that needs to be done in relation to kind of understanding um, our contribution as black people to the UK and to developing um, the country as a whole, but also um, the wealth, the riches that we bring to social work, um, to, to you know, to working with clients, to working with service users, to interacting um, at, uh, uh, um, with each other, you know, as colleagues as well. And I think it was President Smith Haley that mentioned representation and you know how we need um, a lot more, you know, black academics, black leaders, um, in order to kind of push to push things forward. Because although I said I, I'm working, you know, in terms of um, trying to implement anti-racist practice on, you know, pre-qualifying um, uh, um, standards. Um, it's important that the leaders, those who have the power to control the culture in an organisation, those who have the power to implement the policies and 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 the the regulations um, as well, has a real understanding and a real need, a real appetite um, for it. I think it, it was um, Professor Bullock that mentioned that you know it is like a bowl has been thrown on people's laps and. What I'm being racist. We hear a term of this this term microaggression, you know, which is racism, you know, but it's the subtleties of racism. And I think that's the differences um, between kind of the UK and America. You know, I think the US is it, it would appear it's a lot more overt um, in terms of racism. Our police don't carry guns, but yet still, you know, black people are still getting murdered. Um, mental health, you know, overrepresentation in the prisons. And I know we're going, I'm going on to another question, so I won't go in, into too much, but racism is, is endemic, it's embedded in the systems and structures um, and social work is no different. Um, and we have to actively, consciously work, you know, not only to shine the light on ourselves, because I think we all have, black and white people have to look at themselves um, around uh, how we're conditioned, how we've been socialized and what we see as, as right. Um, um, before we can then go out to 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 practice and to you know work you know anti-racist with, with our families and and with you know the communities in which we serve um, so yeah I think I'll pause there thank you so much Ms. Thomas Michelle I'll pass it to you yeah I think this is really a great way to start this off I appreciate um, all of the comments that have been made and I really appreciate hearing some of the similarities between what's um, going on here uh, in the US versus, and what's going on in the UK, you know, hearing that, you know, there was a long time when, you know, we weren't even allowed to talk about the issues that were facing the black community. We weren't, we weren't allowed, our voices weren't heard. We weren't allowed to have those, those, our voices in those spaces. And so, you know, we had to, we had to push it so that our voices could be heard. 
And um, I appreciate also this, this, which is something I've been dealing with myself is this idea that all of a sudden in 2020, all of a sudden people have this reckoning and awakening as though racism didn't exist until then. Um, and so I really would like to just think about since, since 2020, you know, the discussions um, about um, policing, family separation, licensing, um, you know, white supremacy, all of that has dramatically increased within the field. Um, you know, there was a, there was definitely, I agree with Dr. Bullock um, wholeheartedly, there was a huge part of our field that thought we were in this post-racial issue, that era where these, these issues weren't, um, weren't present. Um, but we're beginning to have these conversations and this anti-racist language theorism, theorizing and action shift as we've been talking about is here. Um, but what's missing? What's missing in the conversation? Um, you know, um, Dr. Bullock talked about the direct practitioners. Um, that's something, what's missing? What's missing in the conversation that we're having? And I'll start with- um, I'm, I'm gonna say the thing that's missing in the conversation is truth. Is that in mm -hmm. although the truth, you know, although the truth is, um, has some a relativeness to it, there, there's data and as social workers, we look at the data. Let's look, what do, what do the outcomes demonstrate? If you look at the outcomes for black people in this country, that you have to think that either we have some serious systemic issues that causes these outcomes or there's something seriously wrong with black people. So it's either one of the two things because when you're only 13% of the population, you 40% of the prison system. So you're only 13% mm -hmm. of the population and then you, are, you got 50% in poverty. When you are only 13% of the population, how do we how do we come up with these outcomes? And as a profession, we know that systems can bring about outcomes. Now, in my opinion, it is the desired outcome. It is the outcome and the desire to maintain the underclass, which is required for capitalism, right? In order for capitalism to thrive, somebody got to be at the bottom, somebody has to be at the top. So when you have poor education systems in urban communities that are predominantly black, predominantly people of color, when you have when you have hyper hyper justice systems that put people in jail for long periods of time, that's not about making change and really about rehabilitating the truth. We have to have these truthful conversations. And very often, black people are brought to the table to talk about racism, something that we didn't create, something that we have been the victims of. White people need to talk about racism. Talk about how are you still benefiting from racism. How as a, as a profession are white social workers benefiting from racism? Let's have that discussion. Let white social workers, can you articulate how that is? Because it's an important thing to see. And we will talk about the licensure, but the licensure is another way to create that, right? So we've created an underclass of social workers, the people who have to go do what we call old fashioned social workers. People gotta go knock on doors. The people who have to go check on people. These are not the clinicians, right? These are not the people who the majority, 91% of white women passing the test. They're not going door to door, but they're sending, they're sending black social workers who, have, who are struggling passing the test, who make $25,000 less than they do to go in the community to do the work. So the issue is that why aren't we having truth? Why do we have problems? I have major issues with, with truth that's going on by some organizations, like for example, the, inter, the interstate compact, right? So as a black woman in Louisiana, where we have high crime rate and one of the worst school systems in the country, I don't think that children in our community can benefit from somebody from Texas or California telehealth and into my community. Now you can still build and make a lot of money, but where is the impact? Why aren't we trying to help people in the community do well so they can make that kind of money and resources? So the racism is such an entrenched part. And when you become, you know, you have this liberal view and you have a conservative view and it ain't a dime worth of difference between them, right? At the end of the day, when the outcomes are still the same and we still have more black clients than we have black professionals, then that's when the truth needs to come out. 
and who is in control? Who has the power? Schools of social work have the power. Who are you hiring? Who are you admitting? Is the reason why USC black and white test scores similar because they only take people who test high, take, uh, test high on the GRE? I'm gonna say yes, right? I'm going to say there is a cleaning that's done to ensure that you get the kind of outcome. And as social workers, we need to look at what can we do to make that change. And when you're looking at it, it's more than language. It's more than practice, practice. It's about what is the practice? What is happening in the community? What's happening in the boardroom? You have all of these nonprofits, 70% of their clients are, are black people and people of color and the entire board is white. It's something wrong with that. And we really need to look at who makes the decisions. I only sit at the table to turn it over because I don't eat with everybody because I understand that everybody is, what you serving is not appropriate for my diet. But what I'm here to do is advocate for the black community. And I'm saying the black community, I don't say BIPOC because I think each community needs to represent themselves. The indigenous people do a great job. I, I was extremely proud with the Canadians. When the Canadians came to ASWB to talk about the issues with the test, they were united, black, white, indigenous. They all were saying the same thing. They all understood the plight of those who were not doing well. They all understood that this is an American test. This is about American white supremacy. This is not about what's going on in the community. So when I was sitting there, I was really impressed how Canadians seem to be on a united front. And Chantel, you can speak to it because it could have been a front to me, but it sure looked good that they were speaking the same language about liberation and what it really takes to do the work in the community. So I believe when you're having these conversations, no matter what your pedagogy is, the truth has to be at the core of what it is that we believe and what we're saying. Thank you. Um, Ms. Thomas. Thank you. Yeah, I'm again nodding away because it, the truth ultimately will set us all free. I think what is missing, what is definitely missing is, is the senior leadership buy-in, is those with the power, with the ability to, to really make that shift, um, their own intentions. You know, I think you, you mentioned um, um, President Smith Haley uh, about who is benefiting, who's benefiting from racism? You know, what, 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 what is in it for them? Um, and, you know, th their intentions to, to want to change. And I think sometimes we do sit back and wait for others to make those changes. We need to be, you know, at the table, as you said, not eating with them, but, you know, there to disrupt, you know, there to really challenge and, and really there to, um, um, you know, to, to have people to, as I said, shine that light introspectively on, you know, what is going on, what is going on for you? Why do you feel comfortable, you know, by, you know, having, you know, 25% um, of your, of your, of your, of your, of your clients, you know, you know, the stats that you used around, you know, 30% of the population being black or what have you, and, you know, represent the over-representation in, in prison systems. I can even just talk about the social social work, you know, because that's what we're here to talk about. Um, disproportionate numbers of students failing their placements, failing their, their newly qualified. In the UK, we don't have that separation between um, field social workers, I think you would call them, and, and clinical um, social work. It's just, we're just regulated. It's not licensed, but we are, we, we are regulated by um, what we call social work England, and social workers have to, you know, register, pay a fee, show that they've kept up to date with their CPD, their continual professional development. So it's slightly different in that regard. But what I can, you know, the comparisons I can make is those at the bottom of the ladder are predominantly the black social workers. And the higher you climb, the whiter it gets. And we do talk about the snowy white peaks. Um, and if a system, uh, a white supremacist system is benefiting those that are in power, why would they want to change it? Um, and that's my thing. And it, it's about making them. It's not about gentle, gentle, touchy, you know, um, gentle, gentle, touchy, feely stuff. It is about being a lot more radical. And that's where I get my, um, um, my, 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 my unction from, you know, when we go back to how, how, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, when we talk about the radical social workers, we talk about the demonstrations, you know, we had an anniversary yesterday, um, there was a, a big fire in the UK, New Cross Fire, um, which, which, which is 1981, 18th of January, 1981, which culminated in one of the biggest um, 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 marches for black, uh, for black people in, in the whole of the country. Um, and what that did, you know, that really, 
got people, you know, sitting up, listening, and 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 really thinking about what needed to happen and what what changes needed 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 to be made. But we sit here, you know, 30, 40 years later. How far have we really come? What have we learned um, um, from 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 those days? We're sitting down, waiting for, waiting to be fed. Um, and I do think, you know, we don't have an organisation like the National Association for Black Social Workers. What we have is what I who I work for, Baswa, and I'm probably one of you know in the minority trying to take on the juggernaut which is the social work social work in the UK and you know I hear you know living in the community being part of that community and that's why I talk about my living experience of racism my passion and my, my profession because I'm not dead it's not lived I'm still currently going through that uh, it's my everyday reality um, and if it, if it isn't yours you're less likely to want to to kind of make um, uh, make those changes so what is what is missing is the senior leadership buy-in it is th that um, looking at those with the power those who have um, who 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 are positioned you know in certain uh, spaces and that's what my, my, my research is really looking at about how we um, better come together and I think we're going to one of the questions at the end is about how we work together as a global profession um, to fight. We're all fighting the same devil. You know, it's the same evil. You know, it's entrenched in all of the systems. You know, Smith Haley mentioned, President Smith Haley mentioned, you know, Canada, you know, South Africa. It's every country, every everywhere where social work is practiced, these issues surface. These issues are, 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 are a thing. Um, and yeah, we, we need to do better. We need to definitely um, come together to, to work, to, to push through. So, um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Port. Yes, I'll echo the sentiments of my colleagues and go back to uh, President Haley's comment about truth and whose truth. And we all know that a lie left to stand becomes the truth by believers, those who believe. And we've been miseducated in this country. And the notion of addressing racism and being anti-racist requires that people believe that racism is real. Mm -hmm. There are many social workers who don't think that racism still exists, other than what they've seen on television. And so in their personal spaces, they don't believe that it's happening. They don't see it in the practice settings that they're in. Like, what does racism look like? A colleague asked me. Asked me. I was teaching a class yesterday in which I talked to my students about that. It's a clinical class. And I was talking about the theorist, speaking of theorizing, um, the theorists that we operate on in social work and mental health in particular, for the most part, those theories were erected, erected, constructed by older white men. We're still teaching about Freud in our clinical classes. We're still teaching about Winnicott, all these theories, these clinical theories that we take into the field of social work and try to apply them to black and brown people when we know that none of those theorists ever looked at, saw, worked with a black or brown person. There is no evidence that they ever thought about a black person when they were developing these theories. But yet we consider them to be the grand theories. We expect our students to learn about them and we expect them to apply them in the field. Those kinds of things need to stop. It's not helpful to the populations when there's no evidence to suggest that this is supposed to work with them. And so when we talk about deconstructing these theories, as has been said by my colleagues that are premised upon white supremacy, and we need to name it because that's what it is. And whiteness is the standard by which all else is measured in social work practice. That's part of the reasons why many students of color don't do as well on the exam because it's based on white supremacy, the models and the theories. And, and you know, colleagues will ask, well, how is that so? What do you mean white supremacy? How is it based on, they don't even understand how can a test be race bias? I've had colleagues say, what do you, like how is a test race bias? They have no knowledge. No one's ever spoke about it, identified it for them, named it. Part of the reason we had all the challenges around teaching critical race theory. Why are people so afraid of teaching critical race theory? Why can't we center race? It has had such a huge impact on the development of the US in general. We talk about slavery in February. We, when we're talking about Black History Month, there's so much more to teaching about Black culture when we're always teaching about white culture. And many of my students and colleagues have no idea what whiteness is. When I talk about whiteness, like, what do you mean? Well, it's the dominant framework. 
And we have labeled people talking about languaging and anti-racist language. We refer to people as minority. Minority is not a race. Minority is a status. And so we use minority as a proxy for race. But yet in some regions where white people are fewer in numbers, we don't refer to them as minorities. In Detroit, do they call white people the minority? Do they refer to them as minorities? White people are never referred to as minorities, even when they're fewer in number. And so this language that we're using further stigmatizes and minoritizes people inappropriately. And so, and we're all caught up in it because we've been educated to do so. Every time I hear a student refer to people of color, black and brown people as minorities, but you said you're working in a community that's largely minority. By default, they're no longer, they are not minorities. Right. And so some people have adopted the language that they're saying majority minority. How can you be majority minority? It's only one or the other. You're the majority or you're the minority. And so in number, fewer in number, but it refers to status. So whenever I hear, I automatically think that we think that black and brown people, people of color are less than. Otherwise we wouldn't have this minority unless all people have the opportunity to be minority because we're fewer in number. And I appreciate uh, Dr. Um, President Haley saying not using BIPOC. And we've adopted this language because it's palatable. It's so nice to say BIPOC. People don't even know what the acronym stands for. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've asked people when they said, oh, it's a BIPOC population. I'll say, so who were the people in this population? They'll say, oh, one person said, oh, it's the biracial people. I mean, if you take a moment and you ask people when they're tossing out this acronym, what do they mean? Some people will say it's Black indigenous people of color, but are you saying that indigenous people are black? It's the, the whole, or people will say it's black, indigenous, and other people of color. Why are we othering people? Who are the other people? I mean, I think, and this is my professional opinion and my personal opinion, no one else may agree with it, but the use of that acronym in particular does nothing to empower people of color it further marginalizes people of color. People stand behind the letter that they don't even know what the letter is representing. And if they say that these are the populations you're referring to, I ask a person, well, did you see any indigenous people? Well, no, but they're BIPOC. Well, if the I stands for indigenous, why are you using it if it doesn't refer to the population? So we've come up with this, the use of this acronym, which wasn't intended, if anyone looks at the origin of it, and I'm not gonna give a lecture, it wasn't intended for this use at all. But whenever people can grab onto something that makes it easier so people don't have to be uncomfortable, they will use it. And that is the crutch, that is the tool that BIPOC is for so many people. I have so many colleagues and students who can't even say the word black. They say, I don't feel comfortable saying black, why? I mean, what has Black done for you in your life? Like, what about it that you can't? I'm not comfortable referring to people as Black, so I'll, I refer to those people as African Americans. Well, not all Black people are African American. Amen. I hear from my colleagues who are Nigerian American, Haitian American, they don't, and, and a long list that don't identify with African American. I've been learning from my colleagues who don't, who look like me, who don't identify as African-American, who said, that's for people who don't know where they originated in Africa. This is how my colleague from Nigeria framed it. She said, I know exactly where I'm from. I go back home to visit my family as often as I want to, and frequently as I want to. And I don't identify as African American, because in the U.S., someone has decided that Africa is like a little town or something. Africa <laughs> is a whole continent. And so we there's a lot of educating that needs to take place. And as my colleagues have already said, it's not being taught. It's not being done. And so social workers are going out into the field with this very limited information, continuously offending people, continuously asserting racism, because they haven't been told that it's important to know these things. And if we can't teach about critical race theory and other types of theories that center racism, then it's a disservice to our entire profession for all the reasons that my colleagues have already spoken about. Thank you. I, I have to say, I Dr. Feel, I, feel... I do want to, I do want to say that it is worth uh, restating 
the, the racism in the evidence-based practice, that the assumption is if it works for white people, it works for everybody. Mm. And that's a problem because white people have not experienced the same trauma, i.e. racism and systemic racism that black people have. And when you look at the power dynamic, evidence-based practice is something that is power driven by insurance companies, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're a clinician and you're billing, you have to document an evidence-based practice, regardless of what you're doing. If you're gonna get paid for it, when they come back to audit you, they wanna see the evidence-based practice that you use or they will recoup the funds. So you almost forced to utilize these practices, even though there is no evidence that fit. it works in the community right. that you serve. So as social workers, we are teaching these practices as if they work. And if you want to benefit from it, you have to document what's being told. So if you want me to call it, you know, CBT, if you want me to call it motivational mm. interviewing, if you want me to call whatever you want me to call it, if I'm going to get paid, that's the way I have to do. That's how power is running what we're doing. And we are further reiterating the lies because we have to document it to get paid. Do you understand? So money. I'm not a clinician although I run a mental health rehab and it's a full-time job fighting with insurance companies to get your money, to keep your money, to go back. It is not about when you spend more time with paperwork than with the clients, it is not about liberating people from oppressed system. It is about maintaining the status quo, which has not benefited black people whatsoever. So what Dr. Bullock says is not something that you just say, hmm, this is something that schools of social work, University of Denver, Boston, who does a great job because Boston is probably one of the most diverse schools that we know. They even teach in Spanish to people who speak Spanish. So when you really are going out your way to, to utilize that point, you have to be clear, what evidence does this have working in the black community? How do we know that it works? Because Kaiser says it works, because United says it works. What is the real issue out here? What we're dealing with? And I go so far as to say clinical work is after the problem already began, right? Mm. What are we doing to stop the problem? Because poverty is causing a lot of the mental illness. Health inequities is causing a lot of the mental illness that we're dealing with. And when you look at the social determinants of health, it shows you where you live, where you work, where you play makes a difference in terms of your overall well-being. So how are we continuing to manifest more clients as opposed to more change agents? So I, I could not just let that go by, Dr. Yeah. Luke. I think it's something <laughs> very important that we mm -hmm. need to have that discussion about. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm just going to quickly come in, Michelle. Is that fine? Yeah, yeah I'm just going to say. Have your hand up. So I want to yes. Perfect. Thank you. And just to say, racism impacts mental health. You know, that is a, 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 a massive determinant. But just to bring a UK perspective, you know, um, I think Dr. Bullock mentioned the, the term BIPOC. We have a term here where, it, where they say BAME. Um, and again, they don't even put it as an acronym. They say BAME as a word. And that stands for Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic. And again, that's, that's a similar way it's used in order to, you know, minimize, to, to marginalize. But also uh, people are afraid, as, as was mentioned, to say the term Black. You know, um, if it's a black person, it's a black person. They're, they're scared of having that conversation. They're, they're scared of asking. Tell me, tell me about, you know, who you are. Tell me about your journey to the UK. If they're writing an assessment about a family in order to, you know, to, to get funds, to uh, um, recommend interventions or, you know, to, to work with a, with a family. If you can't ask people about their journeys, you know, if you can't ask people about their heritage, if you can't ask people about, you know, what it's like to be black, how they, how they uh, interact with the system and the structures, how are you going to learn? You know, it's been mentioned that people shy away from that because it's uncomfortable. The hell, you need to be uncomfortable and you need to be comfortable being uncomfortable comfortable because if you're sitting there comfortably having conversations about race you're not doing it properly um, and that's a lot of what I teach as well you it's about getting people to feel uncomfortable in a way that they're, they're able they feel protected and I use that that you know in inverted commas because at the same day we're not protected um, in the same way that you know no one cares about how we think what we think of feel you know day in day out whether you you know whether you're high up in your your, your ranking in your profession or, or you know wherever you're working you know People see blackness first. That's the first thing somebody sees, and that's how they're going to judge you. That is how you know you're you're, you're going to be seen, viewed, and, and and treated. So just hearing about how how much paperwork you have to do to get your funding and everything else, and how you have to sh shape and frame 
the system is set against us you know it is set in a in a white supremacist white privileged society and we have to continually you know break that narrative dismantle that 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 that, that, that um ideology um and also replace it with something different um and and i think that's what i seek to do and hope um is 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 the is the is the is the is the, is the way i want to, to be traveling the direction well, i so appreciate this conversation i um this morning as a matter of fact it um was brought to my attention um, I had already heard about it, that there's a move, well, you've all known there's this move against critical race theory here in the U.S., but um, in one particular state, there's um, now um, several colleges have, presidents have signed off banning the um, critical race theory, and anyone who is, um, any class or professor who is using critical race theory as part of their um, teaching or anything is being reported to the governor. Um, and it's it's amazing. And I everything I've heard, everything you all have talked about is very much aligned with the critical race theory, theory, with the theory, everything we're talking about. Um, and they're even including within this ban any discussion of intersectionality. And so it's it's amazing how you know there's so much fear um, about having this conversation, about talking about the truth, about really putting it out there. And really, I agree, what's missing is we need to talk about it. We need to have these conversations and we need to talk about the truth. We need to put it out there. We need to talk about the race. We need to talk about the racism. And I just echo everything that has been said thus far. Um, I wanna be cognizant of time. We've probably got time, uh, Sophia, for one more question before we, uh, we have got some really good questions in the Q&A. So before we get to that, Sophia, you want to um, put out one more question? Yeah, absolutely. I think what I might do is, is just kind of combine the last three that mm -hmm. we had, um, especially since the conversation has already gone so much far beyond whatever we had kind of put in yeah. this run of show and, and, and been so much richer than we could ever imagine, honestly. So I think, um, so you know, some of the questions were around, right, um, in the U.S. context, we have the Association of Social Work Boards who controls the professions licensing here in the U.S., um, and they released a report last August um, proving, uh, you know, providing empirical proof about how the exams have long been used to, to maintain a white supremacist uh, lineage of, of social work. Um, and uh, there's also, you know, current movements around um, payment for placements um, that as kind of student-led movement organizing. And I think there's about 29 chapters of payment for placements across the US right now. Um, and they're arguing that you know securing paid field work for all social work students is tied to struggles for racial, economic, as well as gender justice. Um, and so you've all spoken so powerfully already about, you know, yes, licensing, you know, yes, some of these other pieces, of course, you know, perhaps payment for placements as well, obviously paying students for their labor while they're here is also a, a deep racial issue. Um, but what else, I guess, is what I want to ask you all is beyond those things, um, what else do we need to can, to be kind of coalescing around as a global profession? Um, and what else is missing, whether it's policies, particular practices, you've named so powerfully education, right? Um, I, if you could just speak to those things in even more depth um, about what else is missing and what are the particular things that we should be coalescing around as a global profession um, to really um, to really truly be anti-racist, which we haven't been yet. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of just open it to whoever wants to kick that off. So I'm on the Louisiana Board of Social Work uh, License. And I and I'm on the board, and, and, and my main reason for getting on the board was really to understand and to better address the, the licensure issue. So we know that um, there is a contrast. So CSWE says, when you graduate from accredited school for social work, you are ready to practice basic baseline social work. That's what they say, right? But the licensing does the same thing. So we got a whole lot of people who are graduating successfully from schools of social work, meeting all of the criteria from a credit school of social work, but cannot make the kind of resources they need unless they pass an additional exam, right? Now, what you gonna do first, which is a major part of the exam, has a lot to do with where you're working, who you're working for, 
and what kind of environment you work in, right? So that is a major problem in terms of how we have to think. When you talk about the exam is legally defensible, right? When that's the majority of the conversation is legally defensible, then you have to look at other things in this country that was legally defensible, like slavery and Jim Crow. So there are a lot of things that can pass a legal test, but do not pass a moral test, do not make sense in terms of what it is we're doing in the practice we have. Ida B. Wells never took a clinical exam. Jane Adams never took a clinical exam. Some of our social work grassroots pioneers never took a social work exam. We've even changed the definition and the meaning of it because I didn't know, because I'm a second generational social worker. My father and all his colleagues were community organized. This was in the 80s as licensure. I did not even know that social workers were clinicians because I went to school to learn how to be a community organizer. So the thought of me spending 26 sessions listening to anybody talk about anything is about the closest to suicide I'm ever going to get, okay? I don't want to sit down and listen to you. I don't even think like that. As soon as I hear problems, I want to hear solutions. How can we fix it? Let's work on it. Let's get the community. But for me to sit down and document some evidence-based practice and talk to you for 26 weeks, do people need it? Yes, they do. But people also need the system to change that is causing some of the problems that they're having in the community. So we really need to look at what is the purpose, how we have created an underclass in social work where people who are in the community doing the work make far less than people who do not. And so how can we balance the playing field? How, why is it that to pass a test defines who you are? Social work was created by rich white women, correct? So getting paid for internships, they weren't doing it. They were do-gooders. They were friendly visitors. They were not members of the society. So what schools of social work have to ask is, why is a student paying you to learn from me for free? Because that's what a field practicum is. You pay the university $3,500, $5,000 to take a class where you come learn from me for free. So then we have to come up with ways to pay you because you need to be compensated in some form for the students. So how can the university share that resource with the client, with the, uh, with the student? Why, why not even excuse that you don't have to pay for a field practicum? That would be a way to compensate a student for field practicum. You don't have to pay for it. You go do what you need to do to register for the class. And then you save that 5,000 so I don't have to try to pay you 2,500. So it's a way that we can come up with what's in the best interest of the social worker and who's really, what are we learning? What are we teaching? What are students paying for? Can I just come in quickly because I want to clarify something because I saw that on the on the run of show around students paying for placement. So what we're saying is that in the U, in the US, students will pay the clinician so that they can learn from them. Is that what happened? Is that what we're saying? You pay university, so you register for a field placement with yeah. X amount of credit. So depending yeah. on where the university is, that's how much you pay for that. So then you have to come work 120 hours, 260 hours, whatever that is, for a agency who's going to yeah. train you and give wow. you field work. So agencies okay. like mine are trying to give students a stipends for doing that work mm. because it, that's what we're trying to do. But the, 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 the paradigm shift is should students be paid for what that learning experience? And I say okay. they either should be paid for it or they should not have to pay for it. To pay for it, it. exactly. Sorry. That's what I wanted to mention. That, that, yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, yeah, so what I think is missing from a U, you, you know, UK context um, is, that, that, is that intentionality. You know, we have to want to, you have to have that intention to want to, you know, uh, um, um, teach, you know, the, the, the new, newly qualified, the students um, around what racism is, anti-racism. Uh, we have to make sure that it has to be a, a part, um, an integral part of the course. Um, as well, you shouldn't shouldn't have to be you know shouldn't have to pay um, anything additionally, and and I can imagine it probably it will affect you know black students, global majority students a lot more um, than it than it does the white students. I, I take it, and I think the only comparison I can make in the UK is you know in relation to the failure rates and how how. Um, we got we get a lot of international students as well. That's another thing. We get a lot of international students in the UK, um, and they pay four times 
as much as a, as a UK based students. So obviously, the international students will be black and brown students um, and their, their, their um, treatment on placements, their treatment within the organizations. Why? Because it's based on the white supremacy. They're coming, you know, from from the continent, from Asia um, and, um, you know, bringing all, all that richness that comes with that and trying to assimilate into a system that doesn't recognize their value, you know, doesn't value their, their riches, doesn't value their way of doing things and wants them to just assimilate into what the UK context is, you know, how the UK says parenting should be, you know, two point, you know, you know, two, uh, a mum and a dad, oops, look at that, my, my light's gone off, a mum and a dad and children, you know, um, we, we know that in, in, in our culture, you know, granny, you know, three generations may be living in one ha household. That's not that's not a, a negative thing. Why does it have to be based? You know, we mentioned about a lot of the um, old psychotherapist Freud, Winnicott, and how that is, is is seen as the gold standard and everything uh, 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 that deviates from that is, you know, seem to be wrong. Um, but yeah, I think what's missing is the intentionality. You know, we have to be intentional with what we want our students to learn. We have to be intentional about, you know, what it is we want to see the system to, to become and intentional with our actions to get there. We can talk, we can talk, we can talk until we actually, you know, um, um, you know, make those strides, bang down those doors, overturn those tables, whatever it is we need to be doing we're going to be here in another 20 years having this conversation and i will add that i think that intentionality that you are referring to is has to come from the entity that are the the driving force or the guiding force for our discipline so in the u.s the council on social work education is extremely important because social workers are educated in accredited schools of social work there is a standard for accredited schools of social work that by which each of us need to adhere to. We need to um, interrogate those. Like what, what are schools of social work teaching based on our educational policy and standards? Social work as our professional organization, it is the repository of our code of ethics, that they're, they're the keeper of it. So NASW has an important role to play. ASWB for now, um, essentially has a monopoly on the licensing exam. It would be great if we didn't have to have these structures in place, but for reimbursement, as President Haley said, as long as there are insurance companies involved or any type of reimbursement source involved, they're going to require some kind of credentialing. And then for us in social work, it's the licensing exam. The, the great thing is that we have new leadership in all of these aspects. And I think you know we stand at a crossroads or where do we go from here? Now, looking back as we've been discussing, thinking about anti-racism and what it means, the education of social workers and all accredited programs, you know, NESW has something to say and do about that in terms of the practice arm of being NESW. But if we think about you know, each time that standards are being updated and revised, et cetera, who is involved in that? I mean, how diverse are we? In, how inclusive are we in any of these standards, if you will, whether it's the licensing exam, whether it's developing the curriculum for educating, or it's the practice standards and policies? I think it's great with the new leadership. I, I would ask, you know, we all, I know I am going to lean into this new leadership and have a voice on these issues and help to support the new leaders in going forward rather than I mean, we can look historically and say, we didn't have access to the test even though we knew something was wrong. Well, we now have new leadership and we have access to the test. So now that we have this evidence, what do we do going forward? And giving these new leaders the opportunity to work with us when I say us, the proverbial us, social workers, at all levels to see what we can do going forward, like how different can we be going forward than the status quo. And I think if we can't take a really close and as has been said, intentional look through a lens and whether we call it critical racism or we don't call it any of that, as long as we do it, meaning we can look at the structures of white supremacy, deconstruct these models. We have to deconstruct them in order to construct new ones. And as long as we continue to center whiteness without even naming it as whiteness, and that's what it is, we continue to center whiteness and then use it as the standard by which all else is measured, we won't make any progress. We'll be standing still for the next decade or century. So I think, you know, with the leadership we have and the commitment on the part of social workers in practice, we can change things. But there has to be, as has been said, intentionality, and we have to be more inclusive. And that's what we, I think, don't look at 
as much the tables that President Haley talked about. How many of the people of color are at these tables? Very few. We're all probably have the experience where we might be the only one. And yes, we need to have one before we can have two, three, four, five, six. But there are tables that are completely whitewashed. There are no people of color of any race or ethnic group there. And that sort of thing needs to stop. And it can only stop if the people who are perpetuating make a commitment and are held accountable. We need accountability. Without accountability, people aren't gonna care what we talk about. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts about that. Um, I think, so just in, in in terms of time, I'm looking at the time and I wanna at least get to one uh, question from our audience. They've been really um, chatty and putting in really brilliant questions. And uh, I wanna uplift one about education because I think that's probably one of the most important points that have been mentioned here today because, um, you know, like you've all mentioned, right? We still we still have a, a basic political ed issue in in our profession. We have people who literally do not understand uh, structural oppression, do not understand racism, how it manifests in the profession, and don't even understand their own actions because they haven't taken the time to reflect. And because, like you said, Dr. Bullock, there hasn't been accountability, and so white folks have been able to just function in this in this field by maintaining the status quo, which is a white supremacist. Uh, profession. And so um, really want to uplift this question around education that asks, um, I appreciate the recognition that not all social work faculty can teach about white supremacy and anti-racism. I brought that up in a faculty meeting and was basically told that was not accurate. So CSWE EPOS that focus on anti-racism mean nothing if people who are unwilling and unable to reflect on their own racism are quote unquote teaching the content. Um, this person is asking, how have you all confronted that um, and, and ways to kind of really confront that on the education piece? Well, in ADSW, um, we have an African-centered social work plan, and we are developing an accreditation for African-centered program. So, you know, just like accreditation, meaning that there's all kind of universities that have African-centered programs, they're all kind of in their predominantly white universities, what do we see in African Center program? What does it look like? And in order to be a NADSW approved African Center, what does it look like? Who's teaching the class? What is the curriculum? How do you master those things? So that is what we're developing. That is our effort to demonstrate what it looks like and who teaches it and how it should be taught. You know, it, you know one of the issues about being unapologetically Black Right. When you're unapologetic, you just speak your truth and you can do that in safe space. Not all practitioners can do that. That's why NADS does exist, because collectively, and when you look at collective work and responsibilities, the principles in Angusa Saba, which is commonly called Kwanzaa, those principles are real principles on which the Black community was founded on. And somebody asked a question about how do you do work in the Black community? You look at principles like the Nguza Saba, but you get people from the community to represent the community. So we call them peer support. We call them community health workers. We call them different things so we can pay them less, right? At the end of the day, you need to get people from the community who are vested in the community, who can live and learn well in the community. And we have to ensure that we include that. Dr. Bullock said, who's at those tables? And we're at different tables because I'm a social work administrator. So I'm dealing with nonprofit organizations. I'm dealing with funders. I'm dealing with federal governments. But Dr. Bullock is an educator. So she's at the table with CSWE. And we have NABSW members who are at those different tables so they can utilize their expertise and their experience. My father didn't get tenure from Washington University in 1983, and he sued, right? He sued and he won for discrimination. Now, what's unfortunate is we're still having challenges almost 35 years, 40 years later, people, Black, black practitioners and Black getting tenured in universities. So if you're not tenured in universities, that's the gatekeeper of who comes in and who goes out that you don't have the consistent leadership of Black leadership in these universities. So we have to look at these systems that continue to perpetuate racism. In order to get tenure, you've got to publish in white, in white journals in order to be premier journals. So these are still things that are perpetuating racism that prevent us from elevating in it effort to advance in social work and do the leadership in those arenas. Thank you, President Smith-Haley. Yeah, open it. Yeah, Dr. Bullock. I would like to add, I, I 
certainly echo everything that President Haley has said, but in terms of educating, we can produce and disseminate and NASW can create its statements, um, but if people aren't interested in reading them, if they're not interested in incorporating them, so to the point that President Haley made about, um, well, this comment also that you read from the person in the audience about colleagues who are saying, no, we can't do that, or there's no way we can incorporate. I mean, people are not intentional about learning about racism. And we talk about the social determinants of health and people can agree like, yes, all of those are social determinants of health, but racism should be in there. Racism should also be identified as a social determinant of health. We have race in there as a social determinant, but what is it about my black skin that causes me to have these outcomes? It's only the way people treat me because of my black skin, not inherently my black skin. And so we should be renaming these things and repositioning them. And I just have to put in a plug for NASW recent publication. Perhaps some folks in the audience have seen it. It was disseminated in October of 2022, so very recently. And it's entitled Undoing Racism Through Social Work, NASW Report to the Profession on Racial Justice Priorities and Actions. And when I ask colleagues, have you seen it? Did you hear about it? Have you read it? It's no, no, no. We have so much autonomy in education in systems of higher education that we can pretty much refuse to do anything. And so there's this, what we refer to as autonomy and the individual gets to decide without this accountability, without these intentional standards in place on the ground, boots on the ground, we're not going to see curriculum change. We are going to have colleagues who are going to say, well, since I can't teach it here, let's offload this to the DEI folks. So let's offload this to, and then we become burdened and the heavy list is on us while many of our colleagues can just escape the accountability for addressing anti-racist practice. Everyone can indulge in or engage in anti-racist practice. Every day, someone has the, each person has the opportunity to do something that's anti-racist, to work towards not being a racist. But it has to start with acknowledging, first of all, that racism exists and that you just might be contributing to it. But if no one names it for you, then you're not going to know. So each individual needs to decide what is my role. And I think if you're in this profession of social work, you have a duty and an obligation. Read your code of ethics if you haven't read it. You're supposed to start where the person is. Each person is entitled to dignity and self-worth. That is not happening every day in practice. It's not happening in communities, it's not happening in classrooms, and each person has a duty and a responsibility to reevaluate themselves and see what is your role in contributing to racism. Thank you, and I'm just going to add. I can, you know, hear to hear, you know, hear everything that's been said. The key to anti-racism is that self-reflection. You know, we all need to do that work for ourselves, and we have to. I think you mentioned it, um, Professor Bullock, around accountability. If we, if we don't put anti-racism on the curriculum to, you know, before people can qualify and have it as a standard on there. In the UK, there's certain um, criteria you have to, you have to, you have to um, evidence in order to pass, in order to qualify. Um, and, you know, in the past we've had anti-oppressive, anti-discriminatory, which you can easily do something around gender or disability and 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 pass, you know, to be, become a, a social worker. Um, we have to be a lot more, uh, uh, um, um, intentional and I keep saying that word because it just keeps coming back to me around race we have to you know force people to force encourage you know um um it has to be part of some sort of um, uh, requirement to re-register. We have Social Work England, which is our regulator, which is probably similar to you guys licensing. Um, and they are the body, they are the power. They are the ones who regulate all social workers in the UK, any misconduct and everything like that. They are the ones that, that would be referred to and, 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 and be dealt with. But um, the course that I run and I develop, again, it, it, it encourages practitioner. It helps them in that space, in that kind of clinical space as well, to really sit and think about what, what does racism mean to you? you know what is it what 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 conversations have you not been having and we do touch on materials microaggression language is important and we spoke about that whiteness white supremacy institutional racism structural racism and then we end with kind of anti-racism and allyship and even allyship is a term that I'm kind of steering away from because allyship would would it would it would, would kind of infer that you know we need saving we need rescuing you know no we don't it shouldn't be only black people doing this work again it's laborsome it's 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 emotional the burden but we do need white people to come alongside because at the end of the day racism was not created by black people 
it was created by the term whiteness and until we unpick that until we uh, um, um, talk about that until you know people are comfortable you know with that we're going to be having this conversation again thank you so much i i've just this has been phenomenal um we are just about uh, at the end of our time. I wanted to give each one of you an opportunity to just give us some last minute or your last thoughts, um, any, um, just to kind of wrap it up, um, any last thoughts, any ideas or tips for our audience about what they can do um, to further um, this work, uh, further this conversation. Um, yeah, and um, let's start with um, um, President Haley. Well, first I wanna say that I love what I do. I love being a social worker. I love working in the community. I am a true change agent. And if you share that same love and knowledge for the community, then making change is easy for you. You see something wrong, you see a, you see a fight as Deacon Jones says, you get in. Right. So I really believe that I need to see more social workers getting in fights. We do the problem solving method, do your assessment. Once you collect the data, identify the intervention and look at what needs to be done and ensure that you incorporate the community because the passion of social work is equals your purpose. And every morning I wake up on purpose. What is it the creator wants me to do? What is it that I can do for the community using the knowledge, talents, and skills that I have? So for all aspiring practitioners, this is not a job you do just because you're looking for something to do. This is a job you do because you want to get in it. You want to get in a fight. You want to win. You want to see the community thrive. So I just encourage you to wake up with that passion, to wake up on purpose, to know what it is that you are supposed to do to make a difference and be able to document it, write it down, be accountable, collaborate, transform, innovate, network, find solutions. All of those things are readily available and there are people in the community that's willing to work with you. So being genuine, being authentic and being passionate will get you very far in the social work community. And I recommend that we work together in order to make a difference for change. I was just going to say amen, sister. And I'll just add, <laughs> you know. Same thing. <laughs> I know, go ahead. <laughs> like, I'm like, yes, social workers, I always say social workers are not, are, not, are, not, are not made, they're born, you know. There's something intrinsic within you that makes you become a social worker. Yes, we can teach you the theories and some of the, you know, the, the frameworks and everything else, but it's something about your soul that wants, you, wants to help, wants to work with, wants to make that change you know and you know uh, the profession is based on um, empowerment and advocating for, for service users and you know um, social justice you know really tackling the ills of our, of our society and that it's not for the faint-hearted you know I think uh, um, President Smith Haley mentioned you know not anybody can do this role it isn't for everybody so sometimes it's you know it's really important that we acknowledge that and acknowledge the the, 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 the beauty of it I love being a social worker too no matter how much you know I you know I can complain and moan and you know this isn't fair that's not right that is what spurs me on that's what is my motivation to continue to want that you know um for the change i may not see the change in my lifetime in my lifetime but i know i stand on the shoulders of giants you know there's there's people that have gone before me and, and, and have really put in a lot of work to try and change the system change the structures in which we which we work in so if it's for my children my grandchildren even my great-grandchildren i will continually you know um, um advocate for those who and i, and I hate saying voiceless because they have, i mean i'm voice because they have a voice they're just unheard they're not listened to um and i think that's important we, we acknowledge that as well we all have a story we all have you know something to say it's whether or not the powers that be want to listen to what what, what it is you know we have but i love what i do um, and i will continue until i take my last breath amen to that dr bullock thank you i would just like to thank the participants for whatever time zone you're in, but thank you very much for your interest and participation um, because you could have chosen to do something else other than listen to this conversation. And I'm, I'm certain that we're speaking to the choir, so to speak. We're, we're speaking to the people who are interested in this work. And you know, I think it's important for us to think about how do we reach those people who don't sign up for this kind of conversation, those who avoid it in every which way they can. And a lot of them, 
from where I sit, and I don't mean here at Boston College, but it, as an academician, as an educator in social work, there are many people who are escaping these types of conversations, who intentionally are avoiding these types of conversations. And I think we need to do more to ensure that people don't get to skirt around or in, avoid this information. As um, President Haley has said, this truth, um, you know, there's an intentional effort to not explore the historical legacy of racism. We do all kinds of things to not look at how the construction of our profession in and of itself, like many others, are based on white supremacy and the historical barriers, the structural legalized barriers for not only our clients and our patients, the communities that we serve, but for us as individuals. And my colleagues have spoken about them, everything from admissions criteria to, to schools of social work, for example, licensure, all these things are structural barriers that further disadvantage people who historically have been denied access and opportunities. And the mere fact that we sit at these tables and have access does not equate opportunity. And if we don't have the resources, meaning curriculum that are based on the truth and the realities of people of color, then we're continuing to perpetuate racism. And so I think I would ask each person who is in attendance to ask yourself, what is the work that you need to do? Inclusive of all people, all races, all ethnicities, we all have some work that we can be doing to look at what is my role in ensuring that I'm not perpetuating racism. And for me, it has to do with internalized racism. I'm at a point and I'm old enough now that I just don't tolerate things um, and I'll speak about them. And, and some people might say that's the risk. I'm willing to take a risk and I can do that. But I'm not saying that everyone can do that. So I think each person has to think about what is their role and what is it they can do to ensure that they are contributing to anti-racist practices, whether that's in your social work practice, your, your personal life as a social worker, because that matters too. We bring whatever's happening in our community into our spaces with our clients and our students. And I think each of us has an obligation to do better. Thank you. I've totally enjoyed being the amen corner uh, this morning. Uh, Sophia, any last thoughts from you? I just had one very quick comment to make, which is just that um, it was an absolute honor to share space with all of you today. Thank you so much. And the other thing I want to say, I want to uplift something that President Smith Haley kicked us off with, which is that um, white people created the epidemic of racism. Um, and it is our ethical obligation um, inside this field, outside of this field to address this, take this on um, and, and carry this labor and do this labor. And so I'm so grateful for you all for sharing your, your thoughts, your expertise, your knowledge. Uh, speaking so truthfully, and I call all white folks in the profession who are watching, um, I will spread this video far and wide, um, and uh, we need to do a lot of work. So thank you all so much. I'll let you kind of end it, Michelle. Okay, Ash, I'm gonna let you wrap us up. Perfect, thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists and to our co-moderators for the vital conversation that we had today. I greatly appreciate it. It's one of my greatest pleasure to be able to support putting on events like this and bring them to fruition after discussion for the time that I've been here, but also the time before me. So if you um, are an attendee today and you're interested in attending more webinars like this one presented by the Graduate School of Social Work, please save the date for our next Catalyst series for social justice, which will be a talk with Alok Vedamenin on February 8th, 2023. For those of you who are not familiar with Alok and their work, they are an internationally acclaimed author, poet, comedian, and public speaker. And they'll be coming to um, GSSW virtually, much like this webinar today, to speak a little bit about their work at the intersection of both joyous expression and deeply targeted hate. Um, that talk will be followed by uh, about an hour's worth of Q&A with audience submitted questions. And so this event is also open and free to all in the um, link for that event and where you can go to register and hopefully get a Zoom link that works the first time uh, is now in the chat. But thank you all again so much for joining us today. I've received several comments in the Q&A just thanking the panelists for their time and their energy and the conversations we're having today, but also we'll be having in the future. So thank you to everyone. Have a great morning or afternoon to those. Thanks everybody. <laughs> evening. 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 Bye-bye.
Gott weiß, ich noch MD. <lacht> Sorry.